Hello and welcome to this video on financial analysis. This is my second video on the role of financing and in this video I would like to go into Modigliani and Miller theory. For this video I planned the following. First I would like to share some preliminary thoughts about the search for the optimal co uh, capital structure. Then I would like to show up some building blocks of financing theory and then I would like to explain the Modigliani-Miller theory as of 1958, that means without any tax, in an illustratory example. Due to this example I would like to deduct the Modigliani-Miller propositions. In 1963, Modigliani Miller um, changed their mind and they introduced taxes into their theory and I would like to show that too. And of course, last but not least, I have to revisit those building blocks and I have to adapt them to what we have seen in this video. And I would like to show some empirical evidence on Modigliani Miller theory. A company typically has to decide about its real investment policy. So what is real investment policy? It's the question which projects should the firm undertake. So what are those projects? For example, like opening a new plant or increasing research and development expenses or scale its operations up or down or to acquire another company. These are only a bunch of uh, examples, there are plenty more. It's open to your creativity to find what a company could invest in. Of course, we know that real investments can create value if the net present value of those objects adds value. So the net present value should be positive. We can find out doing discounted cash flow analysis on those investment opportunities. But of course, with the real investment policy comes the financing policy, because real investment policy implies that there are funding needs. And of course, we already have the tools to forecast the funding needs to follow a given real investment policy because we have already seen in another video how to do financial modeling. If you haven't seen my video on financial modeling, of course, you are highly invited to do that. But if we then know about our financing needs, what is the best source of fund? Should it be internal fund, like cash, so retained earnings? Or should it be debt, like borrowing? Or should it be equity, like issuing new stock? And moreover, today we have different kinds of internal funding. We have cash reserves, we have the possibility to cut dividends, and so on and so forth. We have different kinds of debt. We have bank debt versus bond debt. We have mezzanine capital. We have all stuff like that. And we have different methods to issue equity or uh, like venture capital, getting that in or doing an IPO. So we have many, many different uh, choices uh, to do. So the search for the optimal capital structure, of course, what is that? It is the mix of debt and equity. Let's stick only with debt and equity, it's complicated enough. Um, that maximizes the value of the firm or minimizes the weighted average cost of capital. And Modigliani and Miller wrote their very good article in 1958 and um, they assumed that there are perfect market structures. And if there are perfect market structures, 
financing policy does not affect the value of the company. Investors can accomplish any desired debt and equity mix by themselves, so in their own portfolio. I will show you that in an illustrative example in a few seconds. And they said that the weighted average cost of capital is constant. The proof of Modigliani-Miller is based on the assumption that an investor can replicate any desired leverage in his own portfolio. I'm going to call this a homemade leverage. Of course, in your own portfolio, you can also borrow money or you can also invest money into bonds. So you can replicate um, any desired leverage. These are the building blocks of financing theory. So let us speak of returns and let us speak of cost of capital. Return is always what the investor gets and cost of capital is always what the investor expects. And we have always opposing ideas. So we have a risk-free rate According to the yield curve, this is what you typically get for investing money risk-free. The cost of debt is the interest rate on debt. But, as we know, of course there's an underlying yield curve, but there comes a credit spread on top. The return on equity is net income divided by equity. So what the investor gets, the, the money the company has earned in relation to its equity. The cost of equity is the yield expectation of the shareholder according to the capital asset pricing model. So this is what he wants to have. Seemingly, there can be a difference. The return on equity can be higher than the cost of debt, and that means the company creates value. Or the return on equity is lower than the cost of equity. That means the company is destroying value. The same is true if we um, get this picture before financing. So the return on capital employed is a return before financing, a return for all investors. The return on capital employed is calculated by dividing the EBIT by the capital employed, which is equity and debt. But there is the opposite, the WAC, the weighted average cost of capital or simply cost of capital, COC. This is the yield or the average yield expectation of all investors Again, according to the capital asset pricing model, the yield curve and credit spread because cost of debt is a part of the WAC and cost of equity is also a part of the WAC. And again, if the row C exceeds the WAC, we would expect that the company creates value. If the row C falls below the WAC, we would expect that the company destroys value. But what is now the perfect market condition doing here? The perfect market condition means that given a market equilibrium, these should all be the same. Let us go into risk-free rate and cost of debt. Those enthusiasts that are really much into perfect market condition, they argue there can't be any credit spread because you have the full transparency about the company. And if the company is not doing well, you can liquidate the company before there is any loss. So there is no need to put a credit spread on top um, because there can't be any loss. 
Of course, I have no idea in which world these enthusiasts live, because this is not re reflected in reality, right? So, we do see credit spreads, huge credit spreads. We see that banks include um, expected losses into their credit conditions, um, and that's, that's empirically wrong, definitely empirically wrong. But... Let's go into return on equity and return on uh, uh, cost of equity. Um, here comes some truth into perfect market condition. Of course, if return on equity exceeds cost of equity, yeah, the company is creating value. But then the prices of the shares will go up. And if you don't look at book value of equity, but at market value of equity, and it's going up again, then the return on equity will go down again. So, using the price adjustments, again, return on equity and cost of equity will equalize and find a new equilibrium. The same is true with ROSI and WEC. Again, if the ROSI is higher than the WAC, the company is creating value. But since with creating value the equity prices go up, the ROSI will go down and again we will find a new equilibrium in perfect markets. Let us go into Modigliani Miller theory and let's learn that on base of an illustratory example. Let's think about a company that has a current capital structure. It is completely unindebted. So, the current structure is it has some five million dollar of assets. It has zero debt. So, the whole assets is fully financed by equity. We have a leverage ratio or debt to equity ratio of zero. We have a share price of $10 and the shares outstanding are 500,000. Of course, there is no interest rate applicable because there is no debt. Now there comes a large investor and the large investor proposes to use more leverage. He proposes that the assets, still 5 million, should be financed by two and a half million debt and two and a half million equity. That would lead to an equity uh, debt to equity ratio or leverage ratio of one, because the debt to equity is exactly one. The share price would still be 10. Um, shares outstanding, for simplification, we now put it 250,000, and the interest rate is assumed to be 10%. Now we can calculate the earnings per share and the return on equity under the current capital structure in different scenarios with a given EBIT. So, the scenario is a recession scenario, an expected or mid-scenario, and an expansion scenario. In the recession scenario, the EBIT of this company is 300,000. In, in the expected and in the, in the expansion scenario, the EBIT is higher at 650 or 800,000. The interest is zero since in the current capital structure there is no debt inherited, so no interest has to be paid. And the net income then always equals the EBIT because there's no interest to pay. And we don't have any taxes in Modigliani Miller 58, right? Taxes come later. That will lead to an earnings per share of 60 cents. Where does that come from? We have to divide 300,000. Attention, I just go back one slide by the uh, by the shares outstanding 500,000 and that's exactly uh, 0 0.6 dollar um, and the return on equity 6% where does that come from it's the net income again 
but not divided by the shares outstanding, but by the equity. And that's 5 million, so we end up at 6%. Of course, in the expected and in the expansion scenario, we see higher returns on investments like 13 and 16% because the EBIT and the net income are higher. Let us now have a look what would happen if the proposed capital structure would be realized. Same scenarios here, recession with 300,000, expected 650,000 and expansion with 800,000. Now, of course, the company has to pay interest and it is 10% on 2.5 million. 10% on 2.5 million is 250,000 in all cases, of course. Accordingly, the net income is different towards um, the current capital structure. The net income now is only 50,000, 400,000, and 550,000. Accordingly, the EPS is 0 0.2, 1.6, and 2.2. And the return on equity is 2%, 16%, and 22%. If we now just compare the return on equity, here it was 6, 13, and 16, and here it is 2, 16, and 22, we see that the volatility is going up, of course. We expected that, that is what we call the leverage, and the leverage risk, of course. So we see more extreme values and higher volatility due to the leverage effect. Let us now assume that the firm does not adopt the pro proposed capital structure, but stays with the current one. That's why I chose the orange color again. The investor now is upset and he puts up some $500 uh, dollar and borrows another $500 dollar. Accordingly, he has $1,000. Um, he borrows at 10% and he buys 100 shares. Of course, $1,000, dollar, ten, uh, $10 a share, he buys 100. Now let us take a look into his personal portfolio. The EPS of the unlevered firm, 60 cent, $1.30 and $1.60 are taken here, right? 60 cent, $1.30 and $1.60. We know where these numbers come from. If this shareholder now holds 100 shares, he will earn some $60, $130 and $160. It's simply 100 times the EPS. Of course, since he has borrowed $500 at 10%, he has to pay interest. So we have to deduct the interest, minus 50 in all cases. His net earnings are, accordingly, $10, $80, and $110. Now let us calculate his personal return on equity. Here he earns some $10 at the money he has put up, $500, his equity, and that is 2%. Here he earns some 80 at 500, that's 60%, 16, sorry, and $110 over 500, that's 22%. If we now compare this, we see the same leverage that he had proposed for the company. So even if the company denies to adjust, he can adjust. And since he can adjust on his own, I'm going to call this his homemade leverage. Let's turn the argumentation around. The firm now does adopt the proposed capital structure and does not stick to the current one. But the investor changes his mind and he wants to have the old capital structure again. What can he do now? He now again puts up $500. dollars 
he invests 250 into stocks and 250 into bonds at 10%. Again, we have the EPS of the unlevered firm this time here. Where does that come from? These numbers, right? 20, 160, 220. How much does he earn? He only holds 25 shares because he has only invested $250 into stock. That's $5, $40, $50, $50. Now we have to add the interest on the bond. 10% on 250, that's 25, 25, 25. His net earnings are accordingly 30 or 65 or 80. His return on equity is 30 divided by 500 because that's the money he puts up, uh, 65 and 80 over 500. And his return on equity is, surprise, surprise, 6%, 13% and 16%. And where do we know those numbers from? Here, 6, 13, and 16 percent. Of course, this is also leverage, but downwards, so this is homemade unleverage. Of course, we have to Remember that we assume a world where there are no market imperfections. So there is no taxes involved and there are no transaction costs. We just assume that he can do this at the same cost like the company and he earns or spends the same interest rate as the company. Now, since this is the case, Modigliani and Miller developed three propositions. Proposition number one is, since the investor can costlessly replicate the financing decision of the firm, homemade leverage or unleverage, in the absence of taxes and other market imperfections, the value of the firm is unaffected by its capital structure. What does that imply? That implies that there is no magic in finance, you can't get something for nothing, or there is no free lunch, no arbitrage possibility in capital structure. And capital structurings do not create any value. Based on Proposition 1, we directly come to proposition two and three. We start with number three, because that means that the weighted average cost of capital, the WAC, no taxes involved, um, is constant, independent of leverage. And if we now solve this formula for the cost of equity, let us go through the formula first. The WAC is given by the cost of equity times the equity ratio, because it's equity divided by capital employed, so equity plus non-current liabilities, or let's call it debt. And the cost of debt times non-current liabilities, because that's where you pay interest on, right? Uh, divided by equity plus non-current liability, again, debt ratio. Resolve this formula, we get the cost of equity is the cost of capital, or WEC, however you would like to call it, plus cost of capital minus cost of debt times the leverage ratio. This is very much mirror-like, like the leverage formula that we already know, but only without tax. So, where under perfect market conditions, cost of debt equals the risk-free rate. And with COC being the cost of capital for the business, so for the capital employed, which means before financing. Accordingly, the cost of equity now has two parts. First, the business risk coming from the cost of capital or inherited in the cost of capital and the financial or leverage risk inherited in the leverage ratio. 
Now we can combine the Modigliani-Miller propositions with the capital asset pricing model. The proposition number two, again, is the leverage ratio, right? Modigliani-Miller leverage, because it's not the usual leverage, there we would have return on equity. Here we have cost of equity given by cost of capital plus cost of capital minus cost of debt times leverage ratio. We already know the capital asset pricing model from another video. The cost of equity can be calculated by the risk-free rate plus the market risk rate, uh, the market rate minus the risk-free rate times the beta of the equity. But of course, this must be true for an unlevered company or for the assets of the company. The cost of capital is also given by the risk-free rate plus the market rate minus the risk-free rate times the beta of the capital employed or the assets. Where beta CE is the beta of the firm's asset, that is called asset beta, the beta of the capital employed or, again in other words, of the unlevered firm. And now we start substituting COE by this formula, COC in both cases by this formula, and we could also do the same for COD, but we still assume, perfect market condition, right, that the debt is riskless. And if the debt is riskless, the better of the debt is zero. And if the better of the debt is zero, of course, we can put an a zero here. And substituting now will give this formula here. Let's go just down here. So the equity beta is the asset beta times, in brackets, 1 plus leverage. Or the asset beta plus the asset beta times the leverage ratio. Now, we call the beta CE, or beta of capital employed, or asset beta is what we call the unlevered beta. And the beta equity is the levered beta given a certain leverage ratio. I've just indicated that the debt has no beta because it is riskless under perfect market conditions. Of course, there is a certain discussion in the literature if this is really the case, because we do have risks on debt, and part of those risks are systematic. So there must be some beta for the debt. If this is the case, if we assume a certain risk on a certain um, systematic risk on uh, debt, then we call that the debt beta, and of course, then we would have a longer formula here because we would have to add a term for the debt. We already know this picture, but we know this picture from the leverage effect. The same picture is given here with cost of capital. Let's go first here where the leverage is zero. We don't have any debt in the firm. The firm is completely unlevered. In this case, the cost of equity equals the WAC. Of course, because the WAC, there is no debt, so there is no debt ratio, there is no cost of debt, everything is uh, cost of equity there. But with increasing leverage, the WAC stays constant, this is proposition number three, and the cost of equity raise, rises with leverage. Of course, under perfect market conditions, cost of debt is still the risk-free rate. We're going to see that there are other theories like trade-off theories, Krauss-Litzenberger and so on, uh, that do not go with this. The WAC is constant and 
that this is very important. If the WAC is constant, there is no optimal capital structure because there's no firm value maximizing WAC. Because where the WAC is minimal, the firm value is maximum, at its maximum. But we don't see it here, it is completely flat. In 1963, Modigliani and Miller wrote another article and they introduced taxes. They wrote a correction. I don't know if it's a correction, but it's um, in, in, an introduction of taxes. So, what's the problem here? Interest is taxed as the income of the lender. But equity income is taxed as corporate income and income of the shareholders. So there's a certain difference in taxation between interest and equity income. By borrowing corporations create interest tax shield because interest expense of corporations reduces tax in taxable income. We already know that. Tax shield, right? This leads to a firm that is almost entirely financed with debt. And this is new. This is Modigliani Miller, 1963. Due to the introduction of taxes, um, the WAC is decreasing uh, with, with leverage and the optimal capital structure is at a maximum debt level. Let us see a little example here. Let us compare again, like in the previous video, the unlevered firm U and the levered firm L. The unlevered firm has an EBIT of 200 and the levered firm, since the EBIT is before financing, also of 200. The unlevered firm, since they don't use any uh, debt do not have to pay interest. The levered firm has to pay, pay some interest, let's assume $40. There will be some tax on the pre-tax income of 40%, that's $80 here, and it is $64 here. Accordingly, the income of the unlevered firm is $120, and of the levered firm is 96. Now, we have two opposing effects. We have the levered firm, of course, has less income because they have to pay interest, but they have a little more income because they have to pay less tax. The tax saving, that is also called tax shield of $16, that's the difference between 64 and 80. We can calculate by 40% tax rate times, or 0.4, right? Times 10% interest rate, that's 0.1, times $400, that's the uh, debt, of course. Or T times cost of debt times non current liabilities. Now we have the following issue. This tax shield cannot be replicated in the private portfolio of the investor. Accordingly, a company using debt is valued at a high, must be valued at a higher price. Why that? Let's have a look. Let us assume a perpetuity. So we have constant streams of earnings and cash flows. So these 40 times 10 times 400 are there each and every year. And since the interest rate is 10%, a perpetuity can be discounted at those 10% by just dividing by 10%. Accordingly, the present value of all tax savings, of all tax shields, is $160, or 
if we shorten out the cost of debt, because 10% and 10% can be shorted out, it is simply uh, the tax rate times the debt. And now Modigliani-Miller, their proposition one with taxes must be adjusted. Proposition number one was there is no effect of leverage. But now there is an effect because the company becomes $160 more expensive. So the levered firm, the value of the levered firm equals the value of the unlevered firm plus the present value, this formula, the present value of the tax shields. So there is a value effect of the tax deductibilities of interest that equals the present value of tax shields. Of course now propositions 2 and 3 can be adjusted. The VAC formula we already know from in, uh, introductory courses, the VAC formula with tax, we just have to add the 1 minus t that represents the tax deductibility of the interest that is inherited in this part of the formula. And of course, by rearranging the formula, we can get this formula here, which is the leverage formula including tax. If we now in, um, put together the new Modigliani-Miller um, proposition with cap capital asset pricing, we can also add this little part here and we can add it into those formula too, so that we can also adjust the beta including the tax. So it's, that's just a little uh, adjustment and we can also use it for readjusting betas, levering and relevering or unlevering beta. Now this picture changes. Again, the unlevered firm, for the unlevered firm we still have that WAC equals cost of equity. But due to this, let me go back please, Due to this term here, with raising leverage, of course the debt ratio raises too, this part does not become as big as this part diminishes. So, the WAC is going down. And it stri strives towards the after-tax interest rate now given by Rf times 1 minus t, or cost of debt, 1 minus t, because we are still in the perfect market condition here, despite the tax, of course. With leverage comes uh, an increase in cost of equity again, but, of course, we now have a, a new optimal capital structure, because since the WAC is decreasing, um, the firm value is rising with leverage. So use as much debt as you can. And this is a fact that is empirically seen quite often. That works quite well. This is what private equity companies often do. They often buy undervalued shares of companies and try to lever those uh, companies with um, taking in new credit or taking in new debt. So it qu works out quite fine. Of course the risk is going up too. Now if we revisit the building blocks of financial or financing theory, again here we have the returns and here we have the cost of capital, Nothing changes in the first part, but we ha now have to differentiate between the risk of ac uh, the return on equity of the unlevered firm and the levered firm. Not so interesting for the return side, but very 
important for the cost of equity side. So there is a cost of equity for the unlevered firm and there's a cost of equity of the unlevered firm. Uh, levered and unlevered. <laughs> the same is true for Rosi and the same is true for WAC. There's an unlevered WAC and there is a levered WAC. Of course, the unlevered WAC and the cost of equity unlevered are equal. Now, some empirical evidence on this, because this is so abstract and so there are so much, so many assumptions being made. Um, what is the truth? What is reality here? Harris and Raviv wrote a, a very famous article in 1991, the theory, theory of capital structure, and they aggregated all what has been known so far. Of course, that's a 30-year-old article. Nevertheless, it, it's, it's a nice piece of paper to read. So, bankruptcy costs are important in determining optimal capital structure. So, um, Modigliani Miller, 1963, with taxes, ca cannot be the full truth. Because if you rise the leverage, of course, bankruptcy costs will explode one day, so you cannot take as much debt as you want. That doesn't work out, that's not part of the uh, part of the reality. The more the physical assets, the more the debt level and capital structure, okay? An announcement of equity issues causes negative abnormal returns. An announcement of debt for equity exchange increases stock value. Vice versa, an announcement of equity for debt exchange decreases stock value. We see abnormal price drops following leverage decreasing capital structure. Exchanges are positively re related to unexpected earning decreases. Stock repurchases via tender offers result in sharp price increases. And if a firm becomes a takeover target, it increases debt level. All of that being anomalies to the Modigliani-Miller theory, very interesting and by far not the end of the story. I hope you liked this video. Thank you for listening. See you in the next video.